Greetings, Augies Worldwide. I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG, and welcome to Ham Radio Answers, episode 163. Today we're going to continue a discussion about the J-Pole antenna. Way back in episode 36, we looked at the basic 2-meter J-Pole antenna and discussed how it works. One question I've received several times is how to feed it, and that's what this video is about. First, let's review. A J-pole is a type of antenna that doesn't need a ground or counterpoise to work and is very popular in ham radio, especially on two meters. It makes a great first home base station antenna and can connect via coax to your handheld or mobile rig. It's simple and it's pretty foolproof. The antenna itself is made from copper plumbing pipe and fittings, all of which are available at reasonable price at your local Home Depot or Lowe's, or you can use used pipe. It really helps to have some skills yourself with copper pipe plumbing, or have a friend who does, since you'll have to put it together with a torch like this one, but using rosin core solder. But that's all implementation. Let's step way back and look at the J-Pole. Although it doesn't look like it, the J-Pole is constructed of three parts. The lowest part, the mast, we can just mention and then forget. It can be most any length and can attach to a metal mast or whatever is convenient. The next part is a rather short quarter wavelength section of balanced transmission line. At two meters, this section is only about 19 inches long. It's shorted at the bottom and open at the top. This gives the antenna its distinctive J appearance. The next part of the antenna goes from the top of the transmission line stub to the top of the antenna and is an end-fed half-wave dipole. This is the part of the antenna that radiates. There are lots of interesting things going on, so let's explore this a little more thoroughly. I want to start with the really interesting section, the quarter wavelength long matching stub. But let's start with a more general discussion of transmission line stubs. This drawing shows a one wavelength section of two wire or two tube transmission line on our band of interest. Usually J poles or single band antennas, most of the time for two meters. So a one wavelength section of transmission line is about two meters long, and we assume no ohmic losses. These two thick black lines represent the conductors, either wires or tubes, used to form the transmission line. Now, our first big conceptual leap is coming into view. Let's short one end of the transmission line over here at the left. This forces the voltage between the two conductors at that point to be zero. Given that this is a full wavelength transmission line, the voltage waveform looks like the blue line. It's maximum at a quarter wavelength, back to zero at a half wavelength, and it's negative maximum at three quarters wavelength, then back to zero at a full wavelength. No matter what else you connect this full wavelength stub to, the voltage must assume this form because of the short. Now let's take a look at the current. We see the same sine wave and see that it is phase shifted from the voltage waveform by about 90 degrees. The maximum current must flow at the short. Similar logic shows zeros at one quarter and three quarters wavelength and back to peak at the one wavelength mark. Now, our second conceptual leap comes when we superimpose the voltage and current waveforms and compute the impedance at key points along the full wavelength line. Impedance is computed easily using Ohm's law. Impedance is the resistance taking into account the phase angle. The impedance in ohms is the voltage in volts divided by the current in amps. At the very left, at the shorted end, there is no voltage but high current. So the impedance is zero or close to it. 
At a quarter wavelength, however, voltage and current are reversed. That is, the voltage is at a maximum and the current is at its minimum. In mathematics, something divided by zero is undefined. But in engineering, we look at the value that it's trending to as it approaches that line and that here is infinity. In actual practice, due to ohmic resistance and stray reactants, the impedance is merely very high, perhaps on the order of hundreds to thousands of ohms. So let's take our next conceptual leap and just look at that first quarter wavelength. At the left, at the shorted end, the impedance is zero, or certainly very low. At the other end, which is open, the impedance is very high. This property is very useful as it can be used as an impedance transformer. So our next conceptual leap is to note that if the quarter wavelength transmission line offers zero impedance at one end and very high at the other end, then it must cover every impedance between those two limits somewhere along its length. In particular, there must be a point along the transmission line where the impedance is equal to 50 ohms. And indeed, there is such a point. It seems intuitive that the 50 ohm point would be closer to the zero point than the very high impedance end. Note that because the transmission line stub is balanced, the 50 ohm feed point is balanced. If you're going to feed this with coax, it doesn't matter to which side the center wire or the shield should go. Okay, here's another conceptual leap that shows how we can use a quarter wave matching stub to feed a dipole. This is actually a real product from MFJ, the Model 6120, which is an end-fed ZEP wire antenna for 20 meters. I reviewed this in Ask Dave episode 87. The actual antenna here is simply a half-wave dipole. With dipoles, the lowest impedance is about 50 to 75 ohms at the midpoint. In this case, we don't feed it at the midpoint. Dipoles have very high impedance at their ends because the current is zero, given that it's at the end of the wire, and the voltage is correspondingly at its highest, given there's no more ohmic or radiation losses. Well, we can combine the quarter wave stub as shown in the diagram. The shorted end is at the bottom. The 50 ohm point is 18 or so inches up from the bottom. And at the top, we use the very high impedance to feed the very high impedance at the dipole's end. In actual practice, this works great. This is actually the conceptual equivalent of the J-pole a quarter wave matching stub shorted at the end and fed at the 50 ohm point with the high impedance end of the matching stub connected to a high impedance end of the half wavelength dipole. So now we can get back to the J-pole and with confidence we see how it works. The mast at the bottom is just there to hold up the antenna. Then we have the quarter wave matching stub shorted at the bottom and fed at the 50 ohm point which is not far from the bottom. Given that the quarter wave stub is balanced, we really should use a choke ballon of some sort prior to the feed point. That could be eight or nine turns of RG8X cable just taped together, or RG58. The other end of the transmission line has a high impedance, which matches to the high impedance of the vertical half-wave dipole. Now, a question I've been asked more than once is where the 50 ohm point is. Well, the answer is simple. It's where you find it. This chart shows a close-up of the feed area. I looked at several J-pole plans on the internet and found almost as many answers as there were opinions, ranging from 1.875 inches to 3 inches. In other words, you will need to attach your coax somehow, perhaps with some hose lamps, then raise and lower it until you get a decent SWR. Once you get it, you may want to solder the coax in place. Another way is to figure out the right point for your antenna, then solder an SO239 connector to one arm of the transmission line and a wire connecting to the center pin to the other arm. And let me answer again a frequently asked question. 
It doesn't matter whether the coax center conductor goes to the short side of the J or the long side. As an aside, let's look at my old J pole. I think I got this about 25 years ago. The SO239 connector is attached via screws to two pieces of sheet copper that are wrapped around the legs of the matching stub. Notice how some of the screws have become rather corroded over the years. Fortunately, if I check the DC resistance between the center pin and the shield, the resistance is very low. Ideally, it would be a total DC short. It looks like I'll get a few more years out of this antenna before the corrosion gets out of hand. So what are the dimensions if you want to follow in the footsteps of so many others and make your own J-pole? You can Google J-pole dimensions and come up with dozens of J-pole drawings, all a little different. David Stansbury, KB3KAI, a fellow Augie, has a cool calculator on his website that will give you the dimensions for any frequency. The URL is shown on the screen below. The sweet spot in amateur use for the J-pole seems to be 2 meters. 146 megahertz is the center of the 2 meter band and the dimensions are given in feet, inches, meters, or millimeters. Take your pick. Note the drawing carefully to see what exactly the dimensions are you'll have to take this into account in your build plan. David's formulas assume a 95% RF propagation velocity factor for the matching stub and for the radiating part, and this is a very reasonable assumption. David says to connect the center conductor to the longer pole. It doesn't really matter, do it either way. Play around with the calculator. For example, a vertical J pole for 20 meters would be 50 feet high. On the other hand, in the 70 centimeter band, the height is only 1.6 feet high. There are many variations of the J-pole, for example, using actual window transmission line for the quarter wave matching stub to curling the half wavelength radiating part back over on itself, such as in the Slim Jim configuration. The design is very flexible. As I pointed out, MFJ's 20 meter ZEP is actually a J-pole, but with the radiating part laid over on its side. So, we've reviewed the J-pole design and at least one important variation, the end-fed ZEP. Oddly enough, the J-pole is completely ignored in the ARRL handbook and is only briefly dealt with in the ARRL antenna book. And, oddly, in the antenna book, the dimensions associated with the actual feed point are not given. I would suggest as a starting point the dimensions in David's calculator. So there we have it. I hope you found this video helpful. In channel news, please click like and please share. Click the subscribe option, then click on the bell so you get notification when there's a new video. If you enjoy my video channel, which includes both Ham Radio Answers and Ask Dave, you can support it as a patron by going to patreon.com slash ke0og. Other support options are available at dcastler.com slash support. Until we meet again, be sure to use both feet when walking and 73.